Well, here I am guys, I'm back in the woods again. It's Monday morning. It's about four. Not long after seven. And it's a beautiful morning. You feel very if you can listen very carefully. You can hear the leaves breaking into bud, for it is the start of spring. We've got a slight frost this morning. I've heard a woodpecker and I've seen the machinations of human beings through these woods but it's wonderful and I'm going to make my way to my usual breakfasting ground for a bit of a, a bit of a cook up and a chat and who knows what anyway guys it's a beautiful morning really really nice it seems a shame to speak and break the silence, though the birds are making a lot of racket. Heard a woodpecker earlier, so I'm going to shut this down for a few minutes and then I'm going to make my way to the uh, breakfast hole. Breakfast is some ramsons, wild ramsons, which I picked yesterday. I've washed off. I've got a few bulbs in that one as well. Um, Tomatoes and mushrooms, which I've prepped at home. I shall use a little water, and in here, right, I've got some rice and fish warming up, and tea for the water for the tea, and obviously a little open fire, which I've got going this morning just to use up some firewood that I've got kicking around indoors. Um, well, while that's all busy doing its thing, I'm going to prep some more wood to keep this fire going. Well, what do you know guys? Um, it's nice, very pleasant morning, as I said earlier. Um, I had my breakfast, which you saw. Mushrooms, some tomatoes, a coconut and chilli rice with lime and tomato seared tuna which is sort of boiled in a bag it's actually designed for the rice is designed to be banged in the microwave as is you just tear a little hole in the top so the bag don't explode and then you heat it up the tuna you have to take it out of the packet but you just tear a little corner off chuck it in a pot with water and by the time your water's come up to a good rolling boil you leave it for a couple of minutes then and your fish is heated through your rice is heated through and you've got water for your brew all at the same time um, ooh, I can taste them ramsons again and as soon as that came off I put the um, put the uh, tomatoes and mushrooms on and at the last minute I chucked in the ramsons. The ramsons don't, I found that if you put them in too early they will have a tendency to uh, lose their flavour. Lovely mild garlicky flavour. In fact I was a bit naughty and I picked up a couple of the uh, ramson bulbs and they were very tasty. And, uh, Quite a pungent garlicky taste, obviously, being as it is wild garlic and goes well. Goes well in cheese sandwiches. Um, news on the home front, and uh, I might be getting out into the woods a lot more because I have my release date for my job and I'm being transferred over to this branch of the company on the 9th of April. So no more commuting, spending as much time as possible with my lovely Lady Avalon and hopefully touch this very great tree behind me. Uh, more time out more time out here doing this and um, it's been pretty good. Maybe been watching through been watching going through a few of the threads on uh, Facebook and um, I don't know if you're on Facebook Mick I might have added you actually but anyway 
and uh, I'm a bit naughty sometimes because I can put up some controversial stuff and I like to see what comes back. Um, I did put up a post about multi-tools. I don't personally have, when I'm out here, with the kit that I have, I don't personally find that I need a multi-tool. I have a knife, I have a pocket knife, and I have a throw and a saw. Occasionally I'll bring an axe out. I'll be, I'll be needing to bring an axe out in the next couple of weeks because I want to make a new donk for my throw. Um, other than that, I don't find, I don't find a use for a multi-tool. I uh, did chuck up uh, another line about um, it only applied to the only applied to England and not Scotland and Wales and the law dates back to tw about 1235 long before we were fighting the French and the Plantagenet king at the time decreed under uh, an ordinance of arms I think it was that every mile between the ages of 15 and 60 was to practice his archery every day. And it was on the statute books up until quite recently. And I have since learned that the law has been rescinded, which is a shame because it could be fun to tell someone they're breaking the law without them realising it. But, and it was good. Um, English archers were the most feared archers in the world at one time, or yeah, in the known world. And it's uh, it was a formidable weapon. I mean, there are two types of bows that primarily get used. There's the round bow, which was the weapon of war, which was used by the English longbowmen, and they were made to measure. They weren't just six foot long. They were built around the size of the guy, and they had apparently. They had really huge arms. Um, they're, they're doing some studies on bodies found on the Mary Rose, and they're finding that they were actually physically a lot different due to all this practice. And then there's the flat bow, which is used by the hunter-gatherers. And they've tested the one, they, they made one to the design found by Tolland Mann in. Uh, in Denmark and I found it as an extremely effective tool but far more so than the round bow. The round bow basically shot up like that. Can you imagine about three or four thousand arrows raining down upon you in a battle. I mean no wonder we were feared and apparently that comes from there but there is a lot of debate about that at the moment amongst academic circles but I like to think that the French did that. Um, couple of things from that time uh, to keep it under your hat that's where the bowmen used to keep their pet spare string it kept it it kept it from being too dry and of course the natural oils in your hair kept it relatively well lubricated also to cock up you got three feathers on a on a bow on, a, on an arrow as a flight and the you got two that way and one that way, and that one's called the cock feather. And if you knocked your arrow wrongly and had the cock feather on the inside, it would shoot off that way or go up. So hence the cock up. And um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite, in, it was quite an interesting set of set of remarks coming back. And at least I didn't have to delete this one because sometimes they end up being a bit of a slanging match between some people. I tend to keep out of that. If I think it's getting too too slangy, I'll delete the post. Um, what else has been going on? Uh, oh, I've been having some thoughts about building a natural shelter. You know, out of sticks and twigs, as someone likes to call it. Um, very good these shelters are, but looking around here, the leaf litter sadly isn't deep enough. I'd have to go a long way to get a lot of leaf litter. If it was more birch woodland, I'd have deeper leaf litter. This is chestnut, and the leaf litter is only about that deep. Underneath that, you get a bit of mineral soil, or the leaf litter going into mineral soil. Um, it's been, it's been great. I mean, you know, look, at, thinking about this, it's, it has been good. Uh, in a moment, I'll be demonstrating how to 
light a match effectively. I won't say properly, but okay, in the backwards it would be pro it would be the proper way to light a match because there are many people that have uh, frozen to death. Um, reading a good book at the moment by Wim Blevins. It's called Give, my, Give Your Heart or My Heart to the Hawks. And it's all about the mountain men of the early 1800s in America, particularly around in Utah and what have you. And some wonderful stories in there. They're actually true instances. I mean, they're, they're dealing with guys like Ket Carson, Jim Bridger, Hugh Class, Jedediah Smith, and um, I think it's Tom Fitzpatrick. And it deals with the opening up of the West by the Whites. And it's great. It's really good. A lot of Wim Blevins looked into a lot of the documentary evidence of the period. News reports, the tales that people have told. The, the most fascinating one is of Hugh Glass, who, who um, was mauled by a grizzly bear. And Jim Bridger, and I think Fitzpatrick was with him, was told to stay with him for the, until he either died or recovered. And what happened was Jim Bridger, and Jim Bridger was only a young man at the time, he was about 18 or 19, and Fitzpatrick was a bit older. And after about a week, Fitzpatrick said, look, come on. We'll, we'll just leave him to die because he'd actually he'd virtually died and so they took all of uh, Glass's possibles the, they had a thing called a possibles pouch which is uh, gets some credence in this thing we call bushcraft at the moment and basically what it was was their fire lighting kit their shot for their rifles because they had muzzle loading rifles mostly made by the Hawking Company and other bits and pieces that would help them on their way. And so I took that from him. Fortunately for Glass, he survived. He managed to crawl and make his way for 300 miles to Fort Kiowa. And he was a little bit pissed to say the least. And he was going to do for Fitzpatrick and Bridger, but he realised that it wasn't him, you know, Bridger wasn't the, the nasty guy that he thought he was. And then Bridger went on to f find uh, pathways across the Rocky Mountains. Very good story. There are other stories about Jedediah Smith. And it's basically how these guys went into the mountains collecting beavers and how they made friends with the local inhabitants. Not always, not always friends. Uh, the one, the one thing I've, I've always known is that people have this um, idealistic view about the Native American and First Nations, and yet they are at each other's throats as well. You know, the Sioux is, I think, an Algonquin word for throat cutter. So these weren't nice people. I mean, you know, it's like the Cree were quite nasty, and the Rees, the uh, Pawnee, were quite a friendly tribe, apparently. But it all adds colour to it, because we get an idealised view of the West, and it was hard. I mean, you know, a man could freeze to death, just like that. Um, what, what did strike me, and I, I saw Ray Mears make one on one of his programmes, is the bull boat. And basically, the mountain man got a buffalo hide, they staked some willow wands into the ground, and they put the buffalo hide over the top, stitched it around with the sinew, and paddled down the river. Uh, Jim Bridger actually found the Great Salt Lake. He, there was another guy, there, Nesto, somebody else who actually discovered it about the same time. He thought he discovered this Pacific Ocean. You know, he thought he came upon it. But actually, it was a great salt lake in Utah. Um, the ball boats were not known to the Native Americans, apparently. But when I've seen these boats, they strike me very much 
has a similar design to the coracles that are used in whales. So I'm wondering if there was some sort of carryover because obviously, you know, all the whites in America weren't native to that soil, you know, they and they brought their own traditions and their own crafts and ideals from whichever land they came from, whether it was Wales, Cornwall, Germany, France, Italy, Spain. They took all they took that knowledge, that cultural knowledge with them and it intermingled with the Native Americans. Fascinating stories, and um, it's great. And I say it, it's uh, it's good. I mean, um, in my possibles pouch, which I check back to what I will do in a second or two, I will, I will open it up and we shall see what's inside. Um, I'll keep a few things that I find very useful for me. Some of it's to do with uh, wildlife, and some of it's to do with lighting fires and uh, mushroom collecting. Anyway, um, Sean, I noticed you put a comment up on my Hilbert's Wood video about wild edibles. Anything you want to know, um, just drop us an email or give us a knock on the Facebook. Um, I'm quite willing to share any knowledge. I mean, I'm not, not the secretive type. I would recommend two very, very good books. One by Richard Maybe called Food for Free which will fit into your rucksack, and the other one is The Forager's Handbook by Miles Irving. Both excellent books, and they cover about everything you'll ever need about gathering food from the wild. Having said that, like I said yesterday, where I am at the moment is no, the only wild food you'll get is in the autumn, when you'll have acorns and you'll have chestnuts. Other than that, you don't get anything. The uh, the ground's quite, in a way, quite sterile as far as uh, growth goes. There's there's bracken coming through, and that's about it. Nothing like ramsons. The ramsons are further that way on the other side. Um, what else is there? Well, I mentioned to somebody. Um, I think it was. Oh yeah, I was. I call this a village green, which it is. It's actually this piece of this 48 acres of woodland that I come here every week into um, is actually designated a village green, even though there's a very little grass here, and that's to stop it, that that is to stop it from being developed. It was it was earmarked to have an industrial estate and some housing put on it, um, but the local the local people decided to get together and get this earmarked and designated a, as village green status and it cannot be developed in perpetuity um, you can't you can't make a path through here you can't there's a lot of things you can't do and there's a lot of things you can do and um, thankfully the deer now can wander through here and it will just just be great Anyway, I think I've burbled on enough today. Uh, a few good shout outs, I think, first. Uh, to all those people that have recently subscribed to my channel, welcome. Um, Mike, I just did not know porcupines could climb trees. I mean, that was a surprise to me. And the damage they do makes grey squirrels here look amateurish. And uh, nice to see you back, Sarah. No challenges at the moment, but there's a lot ticking over in my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm busy getting so much sorted out at home for, for the move over to here. Anyway, I shall see you in on, maybe in a few moments. Schlanter. Well, there's Alfie the foraging dog. He's accompanied me today and I'm just making my way back home. I'm going to take some longer walks now. The 
spoons here. I'm going to start taking some longer walks on the Mondays or on my breakfast out. So maybe the breakfast will turn into a lunch. Anyway, it's marvellous. I think I, I'm considerably lucky to have woods within walking distance. And of course, come autumn, there's a lot of fungi through here as well. Puffballs and beliefs for the most part. Um, a few inedible species, you know, things like uh, fly garrick and death cap. But I see it's a great place. I mean, look at it. Nice hornbeam there. Part of it's dead. Got a, a galena type fungus, an artist fungus. Um, just up there, I'll zoom in. Well, that was a that's, that was a felt tree that fell down in high wind. Uh, the guys with their little motorbikes use it as a jump now. They've chopped some of the branches off. Um, I'm saying there's a big hole there, and just across down the bottom there, there's a stream. I don't extract water from that stream because there is so much in the way of bits of car tire and everything that. Boiling that up will kill the uh, pathogens, but as far as chemical pollution goes, you just can't get rid of it. Anyway, I'm going to swing it around. I'm going to step over this birch that come down in some high wind and wind my way home. A very slight frost on the ground. <laughs> 